On this episode, we talk with Buddhist scholar Justin McDaniel about the nuances of Buddhist amulets. So if you want to take a fascinating deep dive into a topic most Westerners know very little about, you'll love this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. So, uh, D. Krab, and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Bangkok in 2001 and who has just run out of maple syrup, so I am about to lodge a human rights violation with the United Nations. <laughs> I support that. It's a human right. <laughs> it is. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 22 years ago, fell in love with winter, in quotes, being 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than summer, instead of 60 degrees cooler. So I never left. <laughs> that's quite a that's quite a drop. I actually, I just read an article about this. They said this, this winter is gonna be cold. They said it might go down to as cold as like 16 or 18 degrees in Bangkok. Oh my God. What's that in Fahrenheit? Like 4,000, I don't know. It might be, it might be like 65 degrees or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I just know that winter here is in permanent quotes. It's in, <laughs> yeah. it's in permanent yeah. I, quotes. I love, yeah. I, I love all three days of winter in Thailand. That's right. We want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons, Yoav Azaria, who supports us at the show shoutout level. Stick around after our interview with Buddhist scholar Justin McDaniel to hear why Thailand is a perfect place for Yoav to hide from his phobia. We also want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get our ad-free regular show a day early, behind-the-scenes photos of our interviews, a heads up to send questions to upcoming guests and access to our Discord server to chat with me, Greg, and other listeners around the world. But best of all, patrons like Yoav also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. On this week's bonus show, we chatted about Greg's mom visiting Thailand at the end of a particularly brutal series of flights, the process I'm now involved in after catching one of my students cheating on an exam, and our friend Mark Ween's new show on HBO Go, which we hope to have a cameo on. Yeah, baby. To learn how to become a patron, click the support button at the top of our website. I can just see Mark walking down the street in Singapore, and you and me are sitting at some table eating some yeah. Singapore chicken rice. And he goes, and we turn around, oh, hello. Hi, Mark. How are you? <laughs> Proceed Perfect. to have a fun conversation. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Right. As always, if you have a comment, a show idea, or just want to say hi, head to BangkokPodcast.com and click on the little microphone button at the bottom right to leave us a voicemail that we'll play on the show. I think I said voicemail, but you know I meant voicemail. Anyway. All right. Well, on this show, we have a very appropriate topic for episode lucky number 13. Our guest is a fellow by the name of Justin McDaniel, the Edmund J. and Louise W. Kahn term professor of religious studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, Justin's got some serious credentials when it comes to this sort of thing. He's got an MA and a PhD from the Department of Sanskrit and Indian Studies at Harvard. He's an award-winning author with books on topics such as Siamese manuscripts and Buddhist rituals, has published many dozens of articles in the realm of Buddhist studies, and is an expert on all things related to Lao, Thai, Pali, and Sanskrit literature, as well as Buddhism and history in East and Southeast Asia. So we thought it would be really cool to have Justin on the show to answer some layman's questions about Buddhism, specifically Buddhist amulets. Now, I think a lot of us know the basics of how amulets work and what they mean, but I also think that all of us understand there's a ton that we don't know. So to help us take a bit of a closer look, here is my very interesting chat with Justin McDaniel. <laughs> All right, well, we are uh, chatting with uh, my brand new friend, Justin McDaniel, who is joining us from the other side of the planet, I believe. Justin, welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah, and you just got back from Singapore, right? here in the U.S. right now, but you just flew back from Singapore. Yeah, I flew back two days ago. Yeah, I'm in Philadelphia now. Oh, wow. Okay, wow. <laughs> so you're all over the place. Yeah. Well, one of our uh, one of our one of our listeners suggested that we get in touch with you because um, you have a really interesting profession. I was going to say hobby, but that's not it. It's a career, right? It's a it's a, a I'm not even sure what to call you. You're a, a specialist, a scholar of of Buddhist amulets. Is that sort of maybe too narrow of a definition? Uh, 
Well, I mean, I'm a professor, a professor of Asian religions, um, and I specialize in Buddhism more broadly, uh, Sanskrit literature, Pali literature, Thai and Lao, and a little bit in Shan Buddhism. Uh, but I teach courses across Buddhist studies um, and and dabble in Hinduism as well. And, but I do write about amulets, and I've been an avid amulet collector and enthusiast for thirty years. Wow, this is it's so it's such a, a niche area. What led you down this path? What what has drawn you towards this? Really, uh, friends in Thailand, um, and then also the fact that. I grew up surrounded by Catholic amulets and protective devices. So I grew up quite seriously Catholic, uh, Catholic school, you know, all the lay sacrifice uh, sacraments you can do, um, right. ritual days, saint cults and all of these things. <laughs> uh, so I always had rosaries and crosses and protective amulets of different saints at home and around my neck. And when I went to Thailand for the first time when I was uh, 20, I lived with two Thai men and they wore a lot of amulets and almost every man I knew and some women collected amulets, wore them, had them hanging. I mean, if they drove, most of them didn't have cars, but uh, if they had a car, they would have amulets hanging in the car, placed somewhere in the car, Sure. Uh, the mantra or what Thais would call prayan drawings, uh, symbolic, it's not really symbolic drawings, but drawings of protective uh, incantations. So it was just very, and it just seemed very familiar to me. I, I'd never really studied Buddhism uh, specifically uh, before I got to Thailand. And then I started, you know, being around a lot of Buddhist, obviously. And, you know, I was flabbergasted of how similar it was to the material culture of what I grew up in. That's really interesting. And it's funny you mentioned that, that sort of, that you got your start for what it's for, for lack of a better term, you know, in, in the rooted in Catholicism, because it's pretty easy. I found for a sort of ignorant Westerner, such as myself to start traveling the world and be like, Oh, look at those poor women being forced to wear a burqa. But we never think about, you know, Catholic nuns wearing a, sh a shroud or sure. we say like, Oh, look at these, 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 these Buddhists with these like magical amulets. And then we're standing in line to eat the, 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 the flesh and the blood of Jesus, you know? Right. So, you know, it's, it's not that strange when we think about it. No, no. I mean, I always describe when people ask me, you know, what my religion is. And I said, well, I, you know, grew up Catholic and, and that I, I believe in a polytheistic cannibalistic religion. <laughs> you know that you know that we eat the flesh and drink the blood of one of our four gods you know every week and we have three male gods and then we have one female goddess but she's the one we really worship it, which is really an accurate way of describing catholicism you know and so i mean i do it you know facetiously but that it is actually and then i always add that and then one of our gods has two dads catholicism is if you look closely at it, it is is a fascinating religion, um, but it's certainly replete with magic and protective devices and you know, mystery and all of these things. And so is Buddhism. So is every religion, really. Right, 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 right. Well, let's let's get away from cannibalism and bring it back to uh, to sort of more local, <laughs> more local topics in Thailand. So let's. I, I wanted to ask you about specifically Buddhist amulets, because it's something that is very, very common here. Uh, you see almost every person wearing them, like you said. Um, we see we've probably all been to the markets and we know a little bit about them. But I think for the average person and certainly the average listener of the podcast, we have a very basic understanding of what they are, what they mean and why they're such a big deal. So first of all, can you just talk about what makes an amulet a Buddhist amulet? Sure. Uh, I mean, they go by various terms. Probably the most common one be prakryung and uh, or parpim sometimes. Um, but then there's specific names. I mean, all, most established amulets have own, their own personal names. Um, and what really makes them is the recipe that they are used in. There really are recipe books. You find uh, recipe books going back. Um, at least 150 years, uh, we find manuscripts of recipe. And there's much older amulets than that, um, but just the recorded, most people were not writing down these recipes 
um, early on. And the main ingredient is pong, is this powder. Um, and the pong can is the kind of sacred umami ingredient, you could say, of it. It's that it's <laughs> okay. it's the it's the one like secret spice that an amulet maker has, and they that's specific to an amulet maker. Um, and then they add ingredients, layer on ingredients. You know, it could be clay, a little bit of oil, bits of copper, um, fruit, flowers, sometimes pieces of monks, famous monks' robes, a hair and bone. Um, lime is really common. Uh, flower pollen is really common. And then it can be very specific after that. It could be a f- petal of a flower that grows at this part of a monastery and that you pick that flower on a very specific day by saying a specific chant over it, or you pick it under a full moon. And like, oh, wow. so each ingredient has a very specific, you know, history to it. And then it could be soil. It could be soil from, you know, where a famous monk walked. It, it could be the blood of, of a famous monk or nun. Uh, it could be the gold flakes off of a famous statue that are put in it. Um, so that these ingredients matter and they are specific to each different amulet. And then the amulets are made in, in batches, uh, usually batches of like almost like a uh, be like a pancake batter almost. Um, <laughs> so you make this like batter of, you know, kind of a liquidy batter, thick liquidy batter, and you make them into batches. And so usually about two to 3000 per batch. Wow. Um, but it could be more, it could be a lot more, um, or it could be less. And um, th- so these ingredients are stirred and they kind of get mixed in, in different amounts in each printing per pressing of that amulet. And then that amulet's released, and if it's popular or if it's valuable or seen as valuable or seen as protective, then they could make a second generation. And they use, you know, the Thai word for generation in that. So it'd be like this prasom debt generation four. So it's like the four, like, and they really do it calls like children of the previous generation. Oh, wow. you know, the previous manuscript. I mean, not manuscript, uh, amulet. Um, and then there's scrapings of stones, especially the by Sema, the uh, like boundary stones of monasteries in Thailand. Um, like you right. can scrape the dust off those rocks. Another common thing in uh, in amulets is the roof tiles of temples. Oh, so geez. you grind the roof tiles up. Um, you know, so roof tiles get worn and the temple starts to get leaky. So you you know have to replace the roof tiles, but you can't throw away roof tiles from temples because um, Thais believe that, not all Thais believe, but many, many do, that those roof tiles have absorbed a lot of incense, but most importantly, they've absorbed a lot of sound from the chanting. So it's no. kind of seen that clay roof tile absorbs sound, absorbs chanting. So you take the tile, you grind that down into dust, and that dust can be go into amulets as well. Right, right. So, so there's like an infinite number of recipes. Like you could you know, you could may put anything in there, really. Yeah, you, you certainly can. Uh, and, and they, the the line between amulet and relic is very, very uh, fine because a lot of good amulets have bits of hair or bone or blood. Jeez, you know, I've got a I've got a seven year old, and he's getting very curious now and asking a lot of questions. And one of the things I've told him recently that kind of blew his mind was that money itself is not valuable. Gold itself is not valuable. It's only valuable because all of us agree that it's valuable. Sure. So yeah. what makes a Buddhist amulet, like what makes one famous and another one not famous? Like what what's that tipping point that kicks it into the stratosphere? Well, it's usually a combination of, of factors, um, like anything that has value. Let's say like a painting, right? That, you know, a Picasso is valuable Um for many reasons, it's f- valuable because of the market value, right? Mm. That it's been determined to be valuable over time and it's sold for this. It's valuable because it's beautiful. It's valuable, you mean aesthetically pleasing. It's valuable because of the personality of the artist. The artist had a legendary life in some way. It's valuable because that artist was connected to another group of artists that were very well known. And it's valuable because it's innovative in some way that that they, it was something different from what was before. That has your, your you know relatively unique qu- 
quality or aspect to it. And then it might be valuable these stories told after the fact that, you know, we hear that when Picasso was painting this long after he's dead, there's a story, we don't know if it's true, that he cut his finger while painting it and some of his blood got into the paint, you know, or, okay, right. he, he, you know, that it was that he hid it away in a basement um, and the Nazis didn't discover it because he hid it behind another painting in a basement or something. You know what I mean? That like there's a story connected with it. And then it might be valuable because uh, it made it through a fire somehow and didn't get damaged or that it was stolen from a museum then miraculously found, you know, in a junk pile in an sure. antique shop, you know, that that there's all these ongoing stories and, and, and amulets are the same thing, that there's not one reason. An amulet for it to be really valuable, meaning like over $100,000. And the, the, the highest amulet I've ever seen, I don't know what the record is in Thailand, but the highest sale I've ever seen is 2.75 million US dollars. Good Lord. So they can get pretty valuable. The vast majority are not very valuable, but um, they can. But amulets weren't really that popular until the 1950s, 1960s. And... They got really popular then because there was a in the famous scholar Craig Reynolds has written about this. He passed away quite young, but Patana Kityarsa wrote about this as well. Um, great scholar uh, coming out of Isan who taught at the University of National University of Singapore. Um, that there was lots of very popular true crime magazines in Thailand. Okay. Um, you can collect these. You can find them in used bookstores in Thailand and kind of like, you know, the magazine and book markets you see around the city. They're um, sort of like not, the old the old school, like pulp fiction style. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Pulp fiction yeah. and so romance. see them in piles at Chatter Jack and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You find tons of these. And, and there was also, they were featured in some very popular films that were coming out in the 50s and 60s as well. And- Thailand, fortunately, has not been in many wars. And so, I mean, recently, in the last 150 years, Thai soldiers have served in Vietnam. Thai soldiers served in World War II, obviously, in fighting the Japanese. And um, Thai soldiers have served in the UN. So it's not that um, – but really, since the Burmese Wars and a little bit of the wars in the 1830s uh, under King Rama III – Thailand has not been involved in active military. So you don't have a lot of like war heroes in Thailand in recent history. So it's a lot of the heroes were coming out of like crime fighters. Mm. And these police, you know, killed 30, you know, bandits that were terrorizing the, you know, Suratani, you know, rural Suratani. And like they captured them and they never got hurt or they fought against the mafia and they were successful. And they were protected by these amulets. And so amulets started to get very popular is that they had this power. And then sometimes you have stories of just wealth that a person gained a lot of money through the lottery or successful business. Interesting. I, I want to go back to what you said earlier about how, you know, the, the actual value, the physical value of the stuff inside an amulet is almost nothing. But right. um, this is something that, that I found interesting is because, you know, for instance, when, when you why a monk, you're not whying the person, you're whying the robe. You're whying, right. you're whying what they represent. So are, are amulets themselves valuable or sacred, or is it what they represent that's really that's really what people are, are craving and paying for? How do they reconcile that whole conflict? I don't think it's really – I mean, that's a great question. I, I don't think it's really reconciled. I, I think the great thing about religion in general um, – and then religious material culture, like pieces of the True Cross, or mm. uh, you know the bones of Saint Mark in Venice, or you know the finger of Saint Catherine of Siena, or you know anything like this, is that people are really comfortable and almost excited by uncertainty and mystery. I mean, we could do scientific studies and we could do historical studies, and many people have, of uh, not actually many people, very few, but. Of, of individual amulets and people are still going to honor them. The truth doesn't stop belief and doesn't stop collecting, mm. right? Yeah. Is that we can have plenty of explanations for the apparitions of the Virgin Mary. We can have any explanations for an amulet of some that though, and that that's not going to stop because people actually want the world to be a little enchanted. You know, I like say to my students is like the big bang is a boring story. 
Like, you know, <laughs> it, it is, it's like the worst story and it's just like, okay, it happened billions of years ago. And you know, like it was pressure and heat and like, that's a terrible origin story. Yeah. That might be the true one. It probably is the true one, but who cares? Like that's a boring story. And <laughs> I never that, thought of it that like, way. Yeah. It's probably because, you know, of, um, you know, just the physics of the car accident and, you know, that it was one inch away, you know, the, the person was one inch to the left instead of the right and they survived. Right. And it's a matter of physics, but that's a boring answer. Like the answer that's captivating is that that person said was chanting right before the accident or they had an amulet around the neck that they had never worn before that was given to them. You know, that yeah. these are better stories. We want to believe. We we want good stories. And I think the vast majority of Thai people I know are skeptical that they also say, you know, it's probably something else. But why not? Like, you know, right. that and wouldn't you rather live in a world where that is true? We willingly enjoy suspended disbelief. That's why mm. we like films, right? That's why we like adventure stories. Like we know this isn't possible or is not probable. I don't know, like an action movie with someone, you say, oh, well, a guy could never fire a gun while dropping off a building because of the physics and the recoil. Right. And you, you know what I mean? You're like, you shut up. Just that. enjoy the movie. Yeah. It's like, shut the fuck up. Like, you know, just like enjoy the movie. Like, <laughs> I think amulets, it's like this almost collective, like we all know we're telling half truths, but we're really having a good time. Oh, that's you know? fascinating. Like, and that's joyful. Like, so there's that aspect of it, but then there's also the aspect of is, you know, it could be true. And the second you rule out anything in life is possible, life gets a lot dimmer and a lot less interesting. It's this idea that if we can make life more interesting, if we can make life more enchanted, if we can make life more um, complex, then then why not? Then why not? What, yeah. What is right. the harm of that? And also it could be not just no harm. It could be a lot of benefit. Like what if, if your mother's dying of cancer, most Thai people I know will go to every specialist they can and they will do the chemotherapy and they will eat, change their diet. They will do all the things they're supposed to medically, but then they'll also chant and get an amulet. They're going to try every, every weapon in their arsenal to defeat that cancer. Because why not? Because why not? And also, what if? Right, right, right. Well, now, now that I just uh, you know, as we're getting towards the end here, you mentioned something about the the, the Chatukam amulets, and I remember for those that don't know, this was a craze. I don't know about ten years mm -hmm. ago now. Um, sure. There was I, I don't know the exact history of it. It's probably not worth getting into. But there was this belief that this specific type of amulet would bring you wealth if you wore it. And uh, mm. I, I remember seeing, you know, it's just seemingly overnight, everyone had a Jatakam amulet or everyone wanted a Jatakam amulet. And they were lining up to get them and they were all over the place. And there was forgeries and people being arrested for selling fake ones. And mm. It was like this craze that blew up. And I remember there was, a, there was you know, my, my local neighborhood crazy guy, my crazy guy on the soy. And he had one on or one that looked like one. And, you know, after three months, six months, eight months, I was kind of thinking like, buddy, you're still picking garbage out of the garbage bins right. to recycle. Like clearly this amulet thing is not working. And I wonder, you know, you multiply that by X thousand people or X million people. Um, so, you know, it, it always struck me as a little, sort of a little bit crass, you know, so can you talk a little bit about the, the, the crassness of the, the um, commercial mm -hmm. commercialization of the amulet culture, like people making counterfeits and, uh, you know, pumping up the prices or, or sure. this sort of things. Like it's, it seems like such an innocent thing, but like a lot of things that started out innocently, there's a side of it that's been corrupted and commercialized and, you know, made kind of gross. Right. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Jatakam Ramute, you know, that, that was a, that was a big, big craze. And it's interesting that it wasn't a Buddhist amulet. You know, this is a, and in some cases, a Tamil Hindu God that was came into, into Thailand through Southern Thailand, through through uh, Tamil immigrants and uh, in the, uh, well, they weren't really immigrants at the time because it wasn't a nation, but uh, the 16, late 16th century. And, um, you know, but it, 
this statue and the amulets came from it lay dormant for like a long time. And so it was fascinating how, and that's how most amulets are. They kind of pop out of nowhere and uh, through historical circumstances and stories that are told. Right. Um, I wouldn't say that things have become commercialized because there's never been a time in amulet history that it wasn't commercialized. Like mm. it, that these have always been commercialized. Um, it's just the ability and the scale. The Jatikam Raman tape, I think was a, was a, a combination of several things. First of all, if we look at the date, this is right after Google started in the world and right as the internet was coming more than just a source of information and a source of like email. Also the first time in history, um, or at least that most people could see images online, that it wasn't just text. So that you had something that would have been in magazines, that would have been known locally, that would have been locally popular in a market, that there would have been hearsay and stories um, locally, um, and that a certain dealer in, say, Patani or in Rayong would have like made a good amount of money selling this and then had local advertisements is something that was on a national scale because of the internet. Mm. And so this came at the right time. So, you know, it blew up and then amulets, you know, you had to go through a couple rounds of people getting skeptical for, you're not going to, I don't think you're going to have in Thailand crazes of that level again, because of the skepticism and mm, people have seen the value drops, maybe, but you've seen the value drop. You're going to get mini crazes all the time. Um, but that was one, that was one that was on a, well, really a national scale and I think it was the right place at the at the right time. And I don't think that because one amulet not working or it being skeptical that it destroyed it, because like the person on your soy, like he could have the right amulet and be the wrong person. That his jaitana, his intention is wrong. Ooh. Um well, that deep. he has had too much, you know, ben wait ben gam. You know what I mean? That he he has had too much bad karma in, in the, I, I don't like to use the term bad karma because karma is actually not good or bad. It's just what happened. Okay, it, um, it just is. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it just is. It's how it's interpreted, but that his intentions were malicious or his intentions were selfish. So oftentimes when you hear these stories of people who avoided pain or avoided accident or gained money is because they were, they were selfless people who had given a lot of you know, their whole life, they'd given donations, they had made merit, they had been good family people, they had been, you know, loyal to the king, they had been, you know, hardworking. Um, and then all of a sudden, they get this amulet, and that unlocked their karmic destiny, which allowed them to become wealthy, like, oh, you know, wow, it was wow. the yeah. tipping point of an already good person. And so, a Thai person and any person can always explain away a good amulet working badly because it's around the neck of a person that is not going to work for. Um, mm, interesting. So that it's those combinations. So that's why same thing with like a lottery ticket or the same thing, you know, with sports betting or anything like this is that evidence over time does not disprove anything. Because right. there's always a factor that we don't understand, that the conditions are always too complex. And so we must not be seeing something. We must be missing something. It's a brilliant system. It's a great system because you can never disprove it. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. Right. Well, then, last question then as we're wrapping up here. Uh, I've been to the, the amulet markets around Bangkok a lot here and there. And every once in a while, you'll see some dude holding up a jeweler's loop to his eye examining sure. an amulet. What are they looking for? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, sometimes I'll totally tell you this. It's posturing. Um, <laughs> is that, you know, that uh, let me look into this. It's basically the equivalent of let me ask my manager, you know, like, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? Like if you want a better price on something, I get a check around back. They're not really checking around back. You know what I mean? They just don't want to lose face or they right. want to pretend like you're getting a special deal. Right. <laughs> so there's a little bit of posturing. Um, another thing is that they're looking for cracks. So they're looking for the way something is aged to check the age. Um, I was actually trained how to do this in, I used to live in next to Wat Rakhang. And so I used to go to the, you know, Taprajan, you know, amulet market a lot. Sure. And I basically, I was basically there every day for about two or three hours for a year. 
and for more than a year, I guess. And, um, and I also used to teach Sanskrit at Wat Mahatat across the street from there. And wow. so that I was in there all the time. And, and, and so one guy who I became friends with trained me how to do this. And you're looking for the way something is aged and cracked. You're looking for flecks of things like flecks of gold or flecks of bone or hair. Um, you're looking for the markings, like the length of the ears on the, of the Buddha, if it's a Buddha image, um, the number of tiers of the altar below uh, the image. Um, you're looking for um, the quality of the carving or it's not really carving because these are stamped usually, mm. um, but the carving of the the master mold color sure. and color changes over time. You're looking for oxidization. Then you're looking for things that are like specific. Like, so if you have something that's a really piece of old material, but you've like you've stamped it new or you've added new things because you want to fake something. You can you can tell often if somebody has put a new press on an old piece of material. And there's also just kind of something about when people get together. I liken it to when people get on a an elevator and you're with two or three people in a very closed space. Yeah. Is that you'll all look at your cell phones for some reason. Like <laughs> that that we can't actually we don't like to be uncomfortable with somebody without a barrier. That's why smoking in some ways, you know, besides it being addictive, there's something to do with your hands. There's something to do like that we want, if you go on a first date, you want to go on a first date where you both can be focused on something else besides each other. You know, that like, whether it's a meal or it's a film or it's a museum, like this idea that people are very uncomfortable, like looking at each other in the eye and <laughs> speaking out barriers in between them, like without right. cell phones, without cigarettes, without entertainment. And so that the jeweler's loop becomes this type of like, like a little bit of a barrier, you know, like a little bit of a separation and it adds kind of a mystique of expertise, but they are looking for real things and, and they, it's, this is not fake what they're doing. It's just that a lot of this time you don't need that level of detail looking at, you can kind of tell right away. Right. Right. Um, some things, you know, certain age or certain things, but so there's a performative aspect about all religion and um, performative aspect and, and then an interpersonal and emotional aspect too. So Yeah, I guess I guess you can just say, well, this is just how you play the game. This is what you do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that it doesn't have to be sacred. Like baseball card collecting, say 30 years ago in the United States, had a very similar kind of mystique to it. You know, like who had a rare piece and showing it off and how well you protected it. And this card used to be owned by this person. You know, there's a right. lot of, it doesn't have to be sacred. It has to be um, complex and mysterious and interesting. That's, that's really cool. That's really cool. Well, I, I don't want to keep you uh, for too long. I mean, I, I, this is so fascinating. I could, I could ask you questions all day about this because there's like every question has nine sub questions to it. It's so, so <laughs> interesting. And like, you know, you've devoted your whole career to this and I imagine there's still a ton that you don't know. Um, oh, tons. Yeah, tons. Yeah. Every time I think I know about amulets, <laughs> I go into a market and I talk to three people and they tell me three new things I never heard of. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. So some, someone, 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 like, someone like myself is just fascinating, a fascinating well to dig into. Where can people, uh, do you have any books or a website or something where people can learn more about you and the work you do? Well, they can just look up, they can just Google uh, University of Pennsylvania, Justin McDaniel, and I'll list my books and articles there. Um, I recently had a book came out that is uh, pretty widely available in Thailand called Wayward Distractions, Studies on Thai, Thai Buddhism. And, um, but I've written before on a book called The Magic Monk and the Lovelorn, or Lovelorn Ghost and the Magic Monk, and another book called Gathering Leaves and Lifting Words, and another book called Architects of Buddhist Leisure. Um, but they're all, they all can see on the web website if they're interested. Right. All right. Well, Justin, thanks for your time, man. It's been it's been really, really interesting. I love talking about this super niche stuff that that most people just don't know about. So it's fascinating. Thank you again for coming on the show. And next time you're in town, uh, let us know. We'll grab our loops and we'll uh, we'll head out to a market or something. See what we can. Oh, find. wonderful! I love that. I love that. Uh, thank you. Dude, man, I blew it. I should have participated in this interview. I, I think this is a fascinating topic. Um, 
I'm also jealous of his credentials. You know, I, you know, I teach an introduction to philosophy and religion. So, you know, I've read books on Buddhism. I probably know more than the average person. But man, like, you know, you know, obviously we've had other experts on Buddhism on the show, but I'm jealous of people with degrees in Sanskrit, Indian studies, like, like true scholars. Like the, the bottom line is I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm proud to be a teacher, but but sometimes I really wish I was like a genuine scholar, like where, where I could yeah. go deep, where I could go deep on something. Yeah, right, right. Like like we talked about on our, on our bonus show, like I want to get a PhD in James Cameronology. Like I'd <laughs> excel right. at that. But, <laughs> but yeah, guy, guys who have put the work in to get this many letters behind their name and this many, uh, you know, accolades, it's incredible. Um, I don't have that drive and it's, it's super, super admirable. It's like me sitting on a park bench, eating a Snickers bar, looking at a guy jog by with, you know, ripped muscles and go, oh man, I wish I looked like that. Anyway, this chocolate bar is delicious. Well, it's just one, it's just one thing to, you know, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how to explain it. It's like I said, I, like, for, for me, for me to teach something in one of my classes, I've got to read a couple books, you know, so that's what yeah. I do. You know, I, I read up on the topic and sure. so I'm just, I'm just ahead of my students. But but I'm not that far ahead, <laughs> you know. I don't have I don't ha- I don't have like a eight years of a PhD program. Like I'm not that far ahead, <laughs> you know. Right, right. Um, you're you're so, like you're like the the mom staying up reading the kids' textbook the night before you help them with the homework or something like that. Right? <laughs> well, almost. I would say I'm a little bit. I might be a little bit better than that. And you know, I have okay. my strengths, like things. You know, since my I have a background in law, so there's certain areas where I'm I'm quite ahead of my students. Um, but it's just, uh, I just appreciate opportunities to talk to genuine scholars. So I kind of blew it. I wish I would have participated in, well, maybe we'll have him back on and I'll interview him next time, Greg. It's my turn. All right. Fair enough. Well, it was, it was really cool. And many thanks to Justin for coming on, but it was just, it's such a, a cool niche, uh, topic. And like yep. you said, in the interview, most, most foreigners know the the absolute basics of the rules sure. and the regulations and stuff but man the, like like he was talking about you could just go every level there's like five more levels underneath it that you can drill down into sure so sure I, I thought that was really really interesting and I, I really enjoyed that so thanks very much Justin for coming on the show and yeah we'd love to have you back uh, on the show again sometime let us know when you're coming through town yep thank you sir all right so one of the new segments we want to try in this new season is something that we call would you rather where one of us picks two contrasting situations tied to thailand to debate and choose which one we'd prefer now ed this is this is pretty straightforward and i think the difference between these two things is pretty minor actually but uh i know which one i would choose so we have all in our lives dealt with bureaucratic hell and reams of paperwork and rules and going across the city to contact this office instead of that office would you rather be trapped in one of these bureaucratic treadmills in america or in thailand ah interesting question hmm i've actually been trapped in both so this is a good question um even um even something as simple as um when i was back in the states i had to get a new social security card so I couldn't oh, right. find my original social security card, which I almost never used for anything, but I needed it. And I knew it was in storage somewhere, but I had to get a new uh, US social security card. And especially um, during COVID times, it was difficult to do because they weren't meeting people face to face. And so there's these online forms to fill out and they had certain requirements like for identification. One of them was a driver's license, but mine had expired. So I was actually stuck in like, and like a, a legitimate American bureaucratic version of hell, but I've also <laughs> been, but I've also experienced that here. Um, like I talked before, when I tried to get a Thai driver's license, they asked for proof of residence, but that was actually a weird particular document, and my permanent residence book didn't satisfy that requirement, which was so annoying. Right, so I was, right, right. Because I was ready to go get my driver's license, they're like, "Nope, you need this other thing," and I'm like, uh, "So this is a tough call." Um. I still okay. It 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 it's tough, but, but I, I still think I probably would have to say I'd rather be in the U.S. one, it, d- d- only because the added layer of language difficulties makes things extra annoying here. Now I usually get help, so I mean usually here I'm I'm not I'm smart enough to bring a Thai person with me or do whatever, but that right. extra layer that extra layer makes it even more mysterious and and 
and and annoying. So even though yeah. even though the U.S. can be quite legalistic and and it's just like I found it quite difficult to meet the the requirements to get my new Social Security card, just the ease of dealing with my first language. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go U.S. Interesting. Yeah, I, I'm I'm using Canada as an example, but they're basically the same system. Um, but I, I think I'm gonna have to also give a slight edge to Canada too, because. I mean, when you're caught in that bureaucratic hell in Thailand, it sucks. And um, the good part about it is that everyone is so nice and they're trying their best to be helpful. You very rarely run into a jerk Agreed. who is just there to Agreed. make your life miserable. That's right. right. So they're, they're, they're as pleasant as can be. And some, you know, it's smiles and laughter and you can joke and this and that. But there's no consistency about it, you know. Right, uh, right. You, you know, I mean, there is, but there there can be times when you're like well last time i did it like this and they're like oh well we don't do it like that now for some reason that's right Where, whereas in this whereas in canada it, it's it's a much more logic based system like a it's b consistent. c d everyone has to do that i that's don't care right. who you are that's yeah. right so it's it's much easier to predict but the people there are generally more miserable to deal with so yeah, yeah. No, I think I think no, I think you've hit it. You you you've hit it exactly right. Uh, it seems like a lot of things in Thailand it does depend on who your person is. So if you just happen to get this person, then they're going to ignore these three requirements and they're being cool about it. You right. know. Yeah, it's like going to get a haircut. Like I got to get this one guy. He's the best. Yeah, the other but, guys but, is but, like uh, you know? yeah, but in yeah, at least in the west it seems to be pretty consistent, like which is probably more fair. It makes it more fair and more predictable. Um yeah. but yeah, you're you're, you're you're probably more likely to deal with difficult people, I would say, uh, yeah, uh, in the West. It's, um, it's far more it's, predictable, but far less enjoyable. Yeah, um, but I do think it's a close call. Like you know, the you know, bureaucracy and paperwork is my is my particular nemesis. I'm, I'm just horrible at like satisfying it. You just when I see that list of you know, I think I think I've joked about it before. If I won the lottery, you know, like five million dollars and they said all right dude you just gotta like fill out these three forms and submit these two documents again <laughs> and, and and get a photocopy of this and you know you get five million dollars it might take me three years to do that like i might be like F you, you're telling me i gotta do what i gotta get a copy of my birth certificate you're like, like and it's I, only five million not ten million right yeah okay, well it, okay it, it would take me a few years to to gather that shit together <laughs> that's funny that's funny it's <laughs> a good one so as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'd like to say thank you to Yoav for lending us his support at the show shout-out level. Greg, what did you find out about Yoav? Well, I got a very nice email from our buddy Yoav, and he didn't send too much info here, but uh, he did mention something I thought was a bit funny. And it turns out that actually he is moving to Bangkok at the end of October, which, well, that's today, that's right now, for nice. a job at a little a little company you may have heard of called Agoda, uh -huh. so, uh, my old stomping grounds. So he's very excited to get settled about that. But uh, he says, yeah, I got no anecdotes that come to mind about funny stories, but I do have a weirdly strong phobia of skunks. Hmm. So does Thailand have skunks? Interesting. I don't think they do. I've never heard of that. I'm sure they know what skunks are from movies and, and cartoons, but Pe Pepe Le Pew. I don't remember. It's a good question. I don't think there is a Thai skunk. That's good. I, That's good for him. Yeah, it's right. It's like I'm moving. To, I mean, he's moving to like a, a skunk free zone. <laughs> So now Yoav, you can you know Yoav can go camping in Khao Yai like completely confident that he will never run into a skunk. However, you do have to worry about wild tigers and elephants sometimes. But yeah, and no leeches. Skunks. Watch out for the leeches. Yeah. But if the, but he doesn't care about that. He only cares about skunks. That's right. Malaria, mosquitoes, deadly spiders, no big deal. Skunks though. <laughs> um yeah, so I mean every, every whenever I've been driving in northern Thailand or around the countryside, I in, in Canada I smell skunk dead skunks all the time and get run over by cars, but I've never smelled one here. Yeah, there were skunks running around my neighborhood as a kid. I mean, not a lot of them, but occasionally there'd be a skunk in the neighborhood. Yeah, did you ever had a dog that got sprayed by a skunk and then you had to wash For them sure. in tomato juice? Absolutely. Ugh, so gross. So yeah, I guess we're all happy that skunks don't exist here. Although now that they might legalize marijuana, you're going you're gonna to have all of the <laughs> benefits of the smell of skunks you have, but without the danger of actually running into one. So uh, that's funny. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, thanks for your support, man. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you uh, on your new in your new in your life in Bangkok. For sure. Thanks, Yoav. A final thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website and connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, BangkokPodcast.com on the web, or simply BangkokPodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. 
Yeah, baby. You can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us voicemail through a website that we'll feature on the show. Or even reach out to me directly on Twitter, where I am BKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone. Take it easy out there. Get your jackets ready for winter. Yep. And we'll see you back here next week. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs>